among the Nobel laureates, your broadness of interests and, and talents, talents is most impressive. You play music, you compose, you draw, and whoever has read any of your texts and books is impressed by its almost literary standard or literary standard. So um, this broad spectrum, in a way, I guess is a, is a good background also for your success, or for an explanation of your success. And um, Keep talking. <laughs> and um, of course, uh, when, when one reads uh, the notes, the autobiographical notes, uh, one sees a, a little town, this area, a wonderful family, a landscape, an inspiring landscape. How much do you think this was important for your imagination, for your decisiveness, for your commitment to whatever you did in your life? What an interesting question. Most of us come from nowhere, and most of us will say, my family wasn't much help and my town wasn't much help either and that's why I left it. This is a uh, an answer you'll hear repeated around the world incidentally. Probably the sober answer here is there are uh, worldviews that we all have that come partly from our uh, cultures, partly from who we are, partly our genes, partly our families. The reason that I became a scholar when I was younger is that I wanted to make beautiful things. And as you age, you discover that beautiful things have many components. And if you are serious about making beautiful things, you must learn more skills than just some equations now and then, or just some experimental techniques. So uh, the short answer is that, um, that the people around me in those days instilled this, this idea that you're here on the earth to make it better in any way you can. And I, uh, like many people, I just take it pretty seriously. And um, in addition, have, um, you might say, an emotional commitment to, to, to keep going. Now, there are lots of creative people in the world, um, uh, you know, and from any country. It's common for most of us to become narrow, not because we want to, but because we need to, to survive economically. So the other part of your answer to your question is that I had some good luck when I was younger. I got famous enough early that I could take risks that other people couldn't take. And um, um, so it's luck. And of course, I took the risks. Um, but it's not just family or genes. It is also uh, some extremely good luck. That's uh, another aspect uh, for among uh, those little references one gets is your uh, underlining a commitment to taking things apart as a child. You, that is a very common feature of, of children, that they have something together and they sort of they satisfy their analytical inquisitiveness by taking things apart. Uh, was that uh, something you would recommend today's uh, children? Let me answer this by telling you a story. Once I was in Helsinki giving a lecture in the um, at the Espo. And I have many friends there, and I had a big audience of graduate students in physics. And I was very tired that night and was full of the devil. So I, I admitted something to them. I said, well, you know, everybody, the fact is that, that I, I made explosives when I was a teenager, and I'd probably get arrested for it now as a terrorist, but that's what I did. I'm just rather curious how many of you made explosives as high school students? everyone raised their hand, okay? 
it was, it was uh, more than 100 people in the auditorium. Now, the moral of this story is that the, the drive to understand things by taking them apart is very universal in the human experience. And some people are more technical than others, and so they go farther down the road. And this particular desire, the strength of it, is a strong predictor for who will be a physicist as opposed to, let us say, a banker or a ballet star. Okay. Apart from family uh, uh, characteristics of your personality, how much influence and how important were teachers in your life? Everybody has teachers that are more important in their lives, and it's usually more than one. Uh, I'm no exception. I had some very good people and some not so, not so good people. Uh, perhaps the answer here is less than most. I had inspiration from a couple, but where, what got me on the scientific track particularly was things I did alone, work, th thinking I did on my own. And you'll find that's a very common predictor for physical science also. You'll find, um, perhaps um, it may turn out years later we'll discover I was learning disabled or something, but um, it's, uh, the, pre the predictor here is the ability and willingness to spend enormous times, amounts of time alone. Are you very ambitious? Most people you meet nowadays are. Um, I'm certainly ambitious. Um, in the abstract, the um, chief difference between me and the students I teach right now is the students are more scared. And so very few of them want to be ambitious artistically. They um, are worried about safety, and so they're ambitious economically or business-wise, um, but uh, very rarely ambitious to make something new artistically. That's, that's rather rare. Now we see you going out and talking to the public. Uh, you leave the, the lecture hall and the seminar. Um, what do you think should scientists do? They should go out more often and should uh, um, sort of get involved in politics and uh, try to influence uh, decisions, public decisions? Um, let me answer that delicately. Those things are personal decisions. And they have very little to do with uh, whether one is a practicing scientist or not. Um, anybody can make the decision to become a political person. Anybody can make the decision to run for office. Anybody can work in government. It, you're not, there's nothing special about scientific training that makes one's judgment better or one's uh, uh, training better for, for working in government. Uh, my own interest in public outreach is, goes back to something rather different, which is theories about what scholars are supposed to do. And in my case particularly, what I'm supposed to do late in my career, given that I'm a theorist, I don't make machines. And what I decided was that that I have my purpose as a theorist is not fulfilled unless I'm a public man. What I can do that people can't do who are in the laboratory is, is write and speak in an engaging way. And so what I should do is take the talent that I had and maximally use it. So not everybody is, uh, is suited for this. They don't like to do it. They're busy doing something else. I, on the other hand, um, have been committed um, since uh, being very young to making things that last. And my idea of the ultimate scientific activity is something like Charles Darwin or Plato. These are written works that you can pick up today and they're fresh as the day they were written and they're wonderful to read. 
you might not un believe them all, but uh, you can certainly understand them as though they were written yesterday. So those are, those are very high benchmarks. I would like to be as famous as Plato and, and uh, Charles Darwin. I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm working hard at it. In terms of education, uh, would you have some recommendation to parents, to political systems, in order to support best kids in their own development? And in particular, of course, in your field, how would one sort of give a context that is promotive to, to the commitment to physics, for example, and less to sort of be economized? It seems sort of all areas are so heavily uh, influenced by econo economic issues and economic interests. And uh, so what, how could one get rid of the manifold distraction that young kids have nowadays. Everybody has opinions about education because they all went through it. And everybody's opinions are different. Now, um, so you asked me generally, do I have, do I have um, advice for, let's say, parents or uh, people in high school who are seeing students uh, go through? The answer is I don't have any general advice. Uh, for the obvious reason, I myself was a parent, and like all other parents, all my plans were wrong. Okay? I had all these great plans for what my children would do. They did wonderful things, but it wasn't what I planned. They did what they wanted. And uh, in a way, we, we made this environment so that could happen, and that was our style. A lot of people nowadays don't want that process to happen because they're so afraid of the person's safety. We have a lot of, for example, it often, often happens at Stanford that a parent will call up the student on Friday night to find out if they're doing their homework. Now, I, I uh, don't prove that myself. I think university is a place where your parents, you get rid of your parents, okay? But the point is the investment by that point is so great that they're very worried that the person has to stay on track for medical school or business school and so forth, and they won't make it unless it's managed. In, um, in um, Northeast Asia, where I worked for uh, many years, uh, most parents um, want their children to stay on track. That's what they're mainly worried about, staying on track, and um, they're not too worried about artistic development Many parents absolutely don't want it. Okay? They want people on track to get their engineering degree and then go work for uh, the appropriate electronics company. Um, now, what I learned from interacting with these parents is that the, the, the cosmos of parent opinion is very large. And we, as professional educators, should never never interfere with the relationship between the parents and students. That comes first. So if a student comes to me independently and says I'm interested in thus and such, uh, then I can give you advice, which is, the advice is very simple, you run with it, okay? You've got the fish on the hook, okay? And if you let the fish go, you're no good. A final question. Uh, if you had the chance in a hundred years from now, to come back to your office and have a first question, what would that be concerning uh, your science? Uh, what, well, let's say I'm uh, coming back to my own office and... Uh, your research center. What would be the most surprising, the most looked for um, answer from, from now? Um, <clears throat> interesting question. hundred years. hundred years is not very long. Um, well, I think the first thing I'd say is students can hear me. 
you stop working on that right now, and you stop working about that. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You won't believe it, okay? And it's really simple, and we're going to go to the board now and explain it to you, and you're going to be awed, and you're going to be so mad you wasted your time on these problems. You're going to work on this one. Uh, I would, it would, the answer is I wouldn't tell. I would relate to people. Uh, 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 basically, you might say in a religious way, it, 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 the good news to come. But would, they, would you expect from them an answer to a central question you have now? Um, uh, there are a number of them. There are a number of such things that I suspect will, will unfold. But I think for the nature of your question is what's to come. That's what you're asking, what's to come. The problem of the 21st century is how life works. Okay? And I'm not sure if 100 years is enough time, but let's assume that it is. Then that's what I would do. I say, you folks, you gather around. I'm going to amaze you beyond belief as I explain to you how life works and how simple it turned out to be. Thank you very much.